that I've been involved with, um, helping to enable uh, the collaborative pursuit of scientific discovery. Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Steve Leonoglu. I am a computational biologist at Genentech, which means that um, you know we work with somehow large data sets to try and find insight into basic biological processes. And um, whoops. I am in the cancer immunology department, and we've seen a lot of great visualizations today, but I wanted to lead off with a different type of visualization. Um, this is a video that was taken by um, Alex Ritter, who is now a postdoc in, our, uh, in the cancer immunology department. And what you're looking at in red is a type of immune cell called a T cell in your body, and these um, cells um, travel around uh, your body and look for foreign things that they could destroy. The thing, th this blue cell here is actually a tumor cell. And uh, we know that at the most basic level, um, tumors are a disease of um, aberrations in your genome. And these aberrations can, uh, in, are supposed to enable the cell to, um, let's say, express some signals on its surface that make it look different than you. And your immune cell can recognize those differences and kill it. Um, and that's what you see the immune cell doing here. Uh, the problem is that we all know that cancers um, ha are quite nefarious and there are many ways by which they evade the immune system or they inhibit the cytotoxic or killing activity of this T cell. And so at the most fundamental level, what we're trying to do is collect the right types of data to understand the processes by which the immune cell engages with its target and is given the green light to obliterate these uh, tumor cells. And on the other side of the equation, we, under, we want to understand how, what are the multitude of ways that tumor cells can evade uh, this process by your immune system. Um, so how do we go about doing that? Uh, we have a large debt of gratitude to thank to this uh, little machine here, which probably fits on this desktop uh, next to me. This is a sequencing machine uh, made from Illumina, and what it allows us to do is um, read DNA at scale. Uh, you essentially, more or less, on one side input DNA that you've gotten from a variety of different experimental methods, and it will provide as an output the sequences of DNA that it has observed. And it can do this um, at a tremendous scale, um, and uh, accuracy. So just to give you an idea, in a single run, which takes about four days, <clears throat> we can generate enough data to sequence 12 different genomes. Um, and to put that in context a bit, you know, the human genome was, was released uh, at about the turn of the century, so around 2000. And it took, I would say, five to 10 years in order for that to happen. So now we could, do, we could sequence 12 of these genomes in four days, right? Uh, another thing that we could do is sequence uh, transcriptomes at scale, and I'm just going to talk about uh, what these are um, uh, briefly and why we want to do that. Um, before I go on, I just want to get uh, a feel for the room. How many of you are actually in biotech? Okay, maybe like uh, 5%. Um, so I would assume those in biotech, are you doing genomics or uh, bioinformatics analyses? Okay, great. So um, I'll just try and provide a little more context on, on what we're talking about. So uh, I had mentioned that this machine can sequence genomes or transcriptomes. And when you sequence a genome, you are trying to identify alterations in your DNA. Things like mutations, insertions, deletions, and amplification, so our rearrangements. And once you sequence that, if you have the ability to interpret the data that you get, you basically um, have in front of you encoded in your genome the universe of things that the different cells in your body can do, whether they're healthy or pathological. Now, when you're looking at a transcriptome, what you're trying to do is detect, characterize, and quantitate the abundance of genes or RNA expressed in the cell. And so why do we want to do that? This tells us which part of the genome is active or turned on. It allows us to understand the mechanisms by which a particular cell performs its function. We could understand what makes a tumor different than a normal tissue, for instance. But we could also understand why a tumor responds or not to a particular treatment. Uh, 
So if understanding the genome gives us perspective on the universe of things that the genome can possibly do, being able to interrogate and understand what's going on in the transcriptome can tell you the thing that your genome is doing right now in this particular cell type in this point in time. So obviously these are things that are very important for us to uh, deconvolve so we could modulate or change pathological behavior um, in order to help people get better. So <clears throat> biology has been transformed into uh, data-driven science. And what I'm showing you is a plot of the, of the cost of how much it takes, you know, how much money it would take to sequence uh, a genome. So as I mentioned, around the turn of the century is when we had our first uh, release draft of the human genome. And uh, this was the approximate cost. Now, this is the cost of sequencing um, as the years go on. And you could see it has recently, um, the, the reduction in cost has outpaced what you would expect if the reduction in cost followed Moore's law. And again, we could almost single-handedly attribute that to this machine that I showed you before. So Illumina entered the sequence market between 2006 and 2007. And you know, they just were getting warmed up and um, they practically revolutionized the types of, the, the way that we could understand what's happening inside the cell. Um, given uh, this vast reduction in cost, you can imagine that the amount of data that we're generating now is astronomical, right? So this is obviously a, uh, you know, it's a cartoon image of what's happening, but it's not, it's not too far off. I mean, if I were to plot the real acceleration of data that we're generating, you know, it would be so fast we'd, you know, open like a wormhole or something and rip through the space-time continuum here. It's, there's a lot of data that we're generating and we need to be able to understand how to use it. What is it telling us? So this is an overview of what the current state of data-driven exploration and discovery looks like in the field. You have two different types of uh, scientists who want to interrogate and interact with the data. Uh, to understand what um, cells, tissues, or larger physiologies are doing. And these different scientists interact and ask uh, with the data and ask different types of questions with the data in very different ways. So a biologist, for instance, might want to look at the expression pattern of his favorite gene or pathway across a number of uh, samples. And a computational biologist with all this data, being sophisticated data scientists that we are, we understand that, you know, all analyses have nuance, and so obviously we're gonna deep learn the crap out of this thing. Um, and just when we're getting ready to get started, the biologist also wants to start looking at what happened in their experiments or a large, uh, across a large collection of data. Oops, sorry. So they'll email, call, contact computational biologists and say, hey, can you tell me what this gene is doing across these samples or what happens when this pathway is mutated, what's going on? You're like, yeah, sure, of course. And so the computational biologist is the one who interacts with the data, retrieves it, and then presents results. Um, back to the biologist, and then this starts the gears moving, right? So now the biologist starts thinking about what does this mean? And now the computational biologist can get off the ground and start doing the types of analyses that uh, she might want to do. But uh, this model has a lot of problems with that, primarily of which is uh, the cause of this, uh, a root cause of this problem is that bio biologists really have no meaningful way to interact uh, with the data. And so what happens in this scenario? They rely on computational biologists for even the most simple types of exploratory data analyses. Um, this results in long turnaround times between the hypothesis that they're looking to explore and the answer, right? And uh, Mike Driscoll gave a very uh, on point quote from Colin Ware, which I love so much that I lost actually, but the, the punchline is delay in your question and answer creates a whole universe of ideas that are lost. And this is absolutely true um, on the biologist side and the computational biologist side. We can't get our juices flowing and things, um, just a lot of things we can't explore. Uh, and as I've ho hoped I've outlined, this creates many context switches and just broken flow for the biologist and for the analyst. Um, another thing is that when we do ask questions and provide answers or insight, the units of knowledge transfer are emails, tables of statistics, and figures, and these are divorced from data, right? So I will, uh, even if I make an R markdown report, um, you can create some interac interactivity with um, these things, 
um, but it's not connected to the sea of genomic data that we've had. And so, right, and th this makes it very hard uh, to iterate um, on these types of analysis between collaborators. So this really is setting up a service model for discovery, it's not a collaborative model. And so what would be a, a better picture? Right, so let's start again with the computational biologist and biologist. Let's give both of them access, meaningful ways to interact and explore their data, and now this just gets the juices flowing without having to ask one help from the other. And uh, of course, there will be times when the biologist needs help from the computational biologist and vice versa, and we want to enable a bridge that allows one scientist to ask or hand off an analysis to the other, and they can iterate on these analyses in their way and return an answer. Again, in the context of the data, not the spreadsheet or figure. Um, these are, will lead to quicker discovery, and uh, the more discoveries we have, the more data we generate, and we have this virtuous cycle of discovery. Um, this is exactly the type of things that uh, this facile data uh, ecosystem wants to enable. And uh, the way that we're doing that, there, it's, there's, right now there are two parts of it. So there's, excuse me, there's a front end, um, which I'm calling the facile explorer. This is designed to enable sustained and independent um, interactive data exploration by non fermenticians It empowers users to compute over data via its GUI, right? And so biologists like to you know, have this reductionist way of approaching a problem where they, you reduce something down to a very simple question. And you could do the same perhaps in computation, right? If you reduce all computation down to one thing, it's gonna be a for loop, right? So if you enable people to iterate over their data, different aspects of their data, you are getting them closer to be enabling computation over their data. Um, and the other thing that um, we're working to enable is to provide an ability to hand off analyses in flight from one scientist to the other and back and forth. And this way, um, it allows people to iterate on uh, analyses and it's not just providing results. It's a point from which somewhere else can continue, so someone else can continue. And so in order, in order to enable a front end to do this, there's a back end, uh, which this facile data back end, and right now I will give you an overview of an, one implementation of that, which is the facile data set. Uh, basically, it consolidates different high throughput genomic data sets behind a single point of access. Um, it provides fast and efficient query and retrieval of arbitrary data and uh, data subsets, so features and samples. Um, it provides a covariate centric view over these data, which I'll explain in a little bit. And this covariate centric view, in my mind, um, provides a data access API that's a bit more conducive to exploratory data analyses. So dplyr-ish, tidy-ish way to analyze these data. Normally the way we store these data are quite different. Um, so let me just give you a small overview of how we store high throughput genomics data. There's a lot of it, and it's, uh, it's a little complex, so what I'm showing you here is, an, is a matrix, this is the data that we're collecting. So in one experiment, if you're sequencing the transcriptome, there are about 25,000 genes, um, and each sample will give you a vector of 25,000 features. These are genes. So we keep track of meta information of these genes on the side table or data frame uh, for, for these, as these assays. And over here, you basically have a separate data frame, worksheet, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, that keeps track of the metadata. And when you have data in this way, you could identify, for instance, all the samples that are normal, all the samples that are tumor, and you can analyze what are the features in here that are different between these two classes of things. Uh, and, you'll f you know, and you will find a number of genes that uh, are differentially expressed between these two things. Or you could ask, uh, what are the different states? Can you identify changes between different stages of, of cancer in these things? So this is one independent data set, and I will be giving you an overview of TCGA that we put inside a FASL data set, um, which consists of many data sets generated from different cancer indications, so breast cancer, bladder cancer, colorectal cancer, all of these things. And so you, as you amass data, um, you will get another independent data set. These will have their own sample um, uh, covariates. Many of them are sh shared. Some of them are named differently, and you need to harmonize these different um, covariates across these data sets, and on and on, right? So eventually we will create a data set that is a combination of many uh, disparate data sets, but we want to analyze it together. So for instance, um, this is exactly what the FASL data set provides, and when I'm talking to my colleagues, I, I encourage them to think of their data as a multifaceted diamond, and the facets of this diamond are defined by the different covariates that you want to explore. So for instance, 
what, what if I wanted to do analysis of all stage one cancers, right? So there is a stage covariate that's across all these different samples, and I will pull out all of these stage one cancers. What about stage two cancers? This, this, this is a different facet of the data set. Uh, that's what you think it looks like, and this is what it looks like in your data. And what about, you know, um, stage one or stage two cancers that respond to treatment? So th th this is how um, I, I, like, I like my colleagues to think about their data. And when you think about it this way, you start an analysis in a particular facet, and you can ask the same question across all the different surfaces of your data set. Um, and so with that in mind, this defines the anatomy of an analysis inside this facet explorer. So I'll give you an overview of a survival analysis. The biologist wants to come in and, for instance, uh, analyze something about uh, lung squamous tumors in a TCGA data set. Um, they'll ask if their favorite gene signature for proliferation, I'll show you uh, in, the app, in, in the app, is it prognostic for survival? So if your tumor cells are proliferating faster, would you expect to, this to be better or worse? And we could split our patients with high proliferation score and a low pro prolifer proliferation score, excuse me, and see, it, it, does this, are patients with a higher score doing better or worse than others? And um, as the plot goes down, it shows you people who are either unfortunately succumbing to their disease or are leaving uh, the study. And uh, the, the faster down it goes, the worse it is for patients. So they've explored uh, this hypothesis in a particular facet of the, table, uh, uh, of the data set, and we want to enable them to ask the same question. Where does this hold? Where does this change? And so we provide this iterative way to turn, uh, to spin your diamond around, and then you get the same biomarker hypothesis in different parts of your data set. And so um, I just want, that, that's um, one thing that we enable. I just want to show you a quick, um, uh, a quick overview of, I can do that in the application, but I want to get to this idea of um, collabor facilitating collaboration and baton passing between analysts and uh, biologists. And so this is a view of, our, uh, of the FASL Explorer. As it, right now I'm just showing you a TCGA data set, but we have our clinical trials uh, in this and so on. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the number of different data sets that we have aggregated into this one consolidated uh, FASL data set. Um, everyone's favorite, uh, you know, UI here, we have a pie graph and we can see uh, what, what is the percent, you know, what is the fraction of different data sets that are currently in my analysis. And here, uh, this gives you an idea of how do the covariates distribute across your data sets. So this is the covariate-centric view of the data that, 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 I want, that, that uh, I'm talking about. So what you could see is these are different stages of cancer, and you can see how these different stages are spread across these different uh, tumor indications. Or you could ask, you know, what, 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 which indications have a higher incidence for males and females. And no surprise, we have breast and cervical here, and uh, so on and so forth. But let's start an analysis, right? So perhaps the um, biologist is interested in only focusing on a particular type of cancer, so uh, lung squamous. And um, how would you know what that means? Uh, below here, we just have descriptive, um, we have descriptions of what each covariate means and they can go in and, and, and understand what is the covariate and where do these data sets come from. So, uh, I'm sorry, let, let me actually just give you, take one more step back. And so when uh, the user doesn't select any facet to work on, there's 8,000 different samples that they have at their fingertips. So with this FASL data set back end, none of this data is loaded yet. It's just ready to be used, right? And so uh, as I said, we enable them to cut into any corner of their data set. So let's look at this lung squamous. Um, let's look at this lung squamous uh, data set. So now from 8,000, we have 500 samples in play. And they'll come here. So uh, on the side here is different types of modules that speak to the FASL data set and perform a very particular type of analysis. So you might come to this scatter plot here and say, look at how does proliferation um, correspond with, so this is a single gene marker. When it's expressed highly, um, the cells will be proliferating. Thank you. And um, this is another marker of the P53 pathway. And when it's up-regulated, uh, cells will slow down the cell cycle arrest or they'll trigger apoptosis. So the initial hypothesis might be that these two things are inversely correlated with each other. Um, the FASL data set, not only does it provide access to different samples, it also uh, uh, provides you access to different assays on those same samples. So we can measure what's going on in a cell in different ways, as we said 
And so right now I want to look at RNA-seq data, not uh, this Agilent, which is a microarray. And um, all of the same covariates that are used to slice into your data to start your analysis, these are the same covariates that you want to use to visualize your data and also perform hypothesis testing with. Um, so you could, uh, on the x-axis, we've put this marker for proliferation. On the y, it's um, uh, cell cycle arrest. And so we could start to ask questions of this data like that you would want to. Um, one thing is we can color it by cancer status. So these cells are tumor cells, these cells are normal cells. As we expect, the tumor cells have a large shift in their proliferation, which might make sense. Um, but there's this issue here of uh, not having, so the biologist will look at this and say, you know, I really expected an inverse correlation here, but there isn't any, there, there is no such thing. And uh, they will want to know why. So uh, we empower them to not only use covariates in the data set, but also to add their own covariates that they discover as they explore their data. So you might say, well, you know what, this is, th these set of samples correspond to, um, a group of, pa of patients that have low KRT17, so low uh, cell, cycle, cell cycle arrest. These, um, these samples are equal, equally proliferative, but for some reason they have this high marker of um, KRT17, uh, of uh, cell cycle arrest. So you could interact with your data, and these interactions are, the, 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 these new sample annotations are spread across the system, and they can come across um, to this differential expression analysis and, and now ask, you know, what are the things that are different between these high and low patients? And they could run an analysis and fetching the data doesn't take too much time, but doing the, um, doing the, uh, you know, the differential expression analysis will. will, will. Um, so in the meantime, they'll probably start drafting me an email and saying, you know, what's going on here? I wish I, th th something happened that I didn't expect. Um, high proliferating cells should have this um, uh, uh, a low cell cycle arrest. And hopefully by the time they're, you know, before they get to send that email, um, the, the, the result of this analysis um, should, uh, should come back in one second. And once it does, they'll be able to explore at the gene level or the gene set level what is um, going on here, right? So now you see which gene, th these are uh, genes that are highly expressed in this group versus this group and, and so on. And you can interact with this data and see what's going on at the gene level and also at the gene set level. So this is about 65% of what uh, biologists want to do. So this can still be unsatisfactory, right? So there could be a set of results that, um, you know, it still doesn't make sense. So what uh, they could then do is now um, save this, these set of annotations um, and uh, the, the, these now become part, oh, that's unfortunate. So the, the, these become part of the system. They could contact me now and then transfer the state of, of the analysis over to me, right? And so from my end, I can now come in using how I want to analyze my, my data, you know, in the R workspace, so just set it up. Um, and now um, what you have to realize is this analysis is really just a chain of parameterized function calls, right? So what do we do? We, de we, ident we define the set of samples that we want to analyze, we define the features that we want to look at, and we want to do a scatter plot. So this is the same idea, right? So I want to define the set of samples uh, to analyze. Um, and just so you can see what, what's coming out of this, this is just a data frame of sample identifiers. Now what I'm going to do is take this data frame and decorate it with assay data and sample covariates that are either in the system or have been added by my collaborator. So um, we define the sample space, we define the feature space, and now we take, these, we take the data and we decorate it with um, sample uh, covariates and uh, the, the gene expression of these two features. And so what I first did was just do a simple cancer normal comparison, and this is exactly what, 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 we, what we showed. The other thing that I could do now is go back into the system, I'm gonna decorate this again and I'm going, to add, um, I, I'm going to add this new annotation that my collaborator put in there. So that you have these high and low samples. Um, and, I, and now I could basically reconstruct, oops, 
I can reconstruct the state of their analysis in my workspace. But not just that, the, you know, the, um, we're leveraging the modularity that Shiny is more and more uh, providing. We could actually launch, um, we could launch these different parts of the analyses in flight from analysis. So now I don't, I don't have to use the Facet Explorer to explore my data. I could um, look at it myself. Um, I can provide my own sample annotations, right, um, or other things. And then I could send this back to my collaborator. You know, imagine this is some sort of result. I could send this back to my collaborator and they'll be able to view it in the Facile Explorer in the way they can, so using, using the GUI. So in this sense, we're um, enabling, this is the baton passing of doing one analysis in the application, continuing it in your, in, in your R workspace, and then sending it back to the application. So uh, I'm running out of time. I, I'm not going to, um, it, when the user logs back in, my annotations will be provided to them. So um, I just want to conclude. Um, so how, is this, how does this look like in practice? So we're, in the long term, we want to exploit this modular design of these analysis components. We want to stitch them together uh, to, to be able to make a report of individual, individual analyses that were conducted in the Facile Explorer. This is uh, an idea that uh, Michael Lawrence actually implemented in, in, in a different setting, and uh, this is exactly wh wh where we'd like to take this. Um, and the important thing is that these reports contain a connection to the back end, to the data. So we're not divorcing uh, the results from the data, and then people can iterate either from the GUI or from the command line. And restoring that state of analysis from the command line might look something like this. Um, and that's basically it. So we want to empower sustained and independent uh, and interactive exploration, and um, we're doing that by providing access to more people and providing them with better ways to communicate to each other um, their results. And I just want to acknowledge the people who uh, played a big part here. These are all scientists at Genentech um, who are part of the Facile Data Working Group um, and have been very important to help push us through. Ben Sant is a key um, contributor to the project and helped uh, developing uh, the code along with myself. And um, I'll just leave the acknowledgments uh, up there, and um, perhaps maybe have time for one question if you have it. So you showed uh, a couple of G, uh, you used the uh, single genes as your, uh, or single expression of single genes as your axes. That's right, yeah. Um, when you're looking at uh, trying to figure out upregulation and downregulation of pathways in general, um, do you have like predefined gene sets, or, yeah. or how do you how do you capture path path uh, Great question. So um, there are predefined gene sets, and they are what are used in these gene set enrichment analyses. In the same way that you can um, brush samples and add covariates uh, covariates to them, where we are enabling people to brush genes in different places and create their own gene sets on the fly. Once you do that, they're integrated. So this covariate, this quantitative trait picker. You could pick the assay, but it's also connected to the features. So I could put in, um, you know, all of my gene sets in the application are also available to you here. So when I pick the proliferation gene set, um, this updates with the genes involved, and it also now scores the samples not on a single gene level, but at the gene set level. And uh, so you, you can do that. And you're expecting all the genes to be in the same direction? To, to, to yeah, so genes, um, you need to curate them that way. And we've, okay. and we've done that um, for the ones in the, in, in the, in the application for now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay.